The turn of the millennium was the changing of the guard in NASCAR. The drivers that had dominated the last quarter century of competition were falling to the wayside, to be replaced by the youthful exuberance and natural talent that car owners were looking for in a post-Jeff Gordon world. Soon, drivers like Dale Jarrett, Terry Labonte, Rusty Wallace, and Dale Earnhardt were having to compete against Tony Stewart, Matt Kenseth, Kurt Busch, and Dale Earnhardt Jr., not only on the track, but in boardrooms for sponsorship dollars, and the older driver's seats were under a threat by a new crop of talent. Add in the emergence of Kevin Harvick, Jimmy Johnson, and Ryan Newman, and by the end of the Winston Cup era, NASCAR had a bright new cast of contenders, while the old guards saw out the remainder of their careers. However, by the end of the decade, NASCAR's driver development systems had hit such dire straits that it led to the oddest stretch of Rookie of the Year candidates in the history of big-time stock car racing. Today, we're going to take a look at the causes that led to this and how the concept of young guns rebounded in the mid-2010s with future stars like Kyle Larson, Chase Elliott, and Christopher Bell. By the mid-2000s, it was common that a hot shot that had tore up the lower divisions or the sprint car scene was going to be put in a top-level cup ride every season. 2004 saw Casey Kane win Rookie of the Year after taking over Evernham's Dodge ride from Bill Elliott, and he instantly became a threat to win many races in his rookie year, only to be let down by bad luck. 2005 saw Terry Labonte step aside from his Hendrick Motorsports 5 car that had seen him nab his second Winston Cup title to make way for some fella by the name of Kyle Busch. 2006's rookie class was loaded with Denny Hamlin, Martin Truex Jr., and Clint Boyer all making their mark on the sport in one way or another. By this point, many of NASCAR's top teams invested heavily into development programs. They'd get you a quality ride in ARCA, Busch, and Cup, and often rather quickly. While this path worked for someone like Kyle Busch, not everyone is as talented as Kyle Busch. For instance, the driver that immediately followed Kyle in Hendrick's development program was Blake Fies, who, like Jeff Gordon, was a Midwestern USAC up-and-comer. While Busch stormed out of the gates in ARCA and the Busch series, Fies really struggled, with his best Busch series finish being 23rd, and in Hendrick equipment, that's not going to cut it. In total, across ARCA and the Busch series, Fies only got a total of 18 starts in Hendrick equipment before getting the axe. Other than a 10-race deal with Turner Motorsports in the Truck Series in 2011, Fies' NASCAR career was over before it really started. Evernham's development program after Casey Kane didn't fare much better. Next up was Paul Wolfe, whose driving career is best known for a qualifying crash he had at Rockingham. He made 16 starts in Evernham equipment in the Busch Series with only one top 10 before being pushed to the side in favor of Aaron Crocker. Fortunately for Wolf, though, he changed careers and is now a two-time and defending Cup Series crew chief and has established himself as one of the premier crew chiefs in the Cup Series over the last decade. Crocker's turn as the next development driver didn't last long. While she did really well in ARCA, her truck and bush efforts suffered, and she only made two more starts in NASCAR after Jeremy Mayfield blew the situation at Evernham Motorsports wide open. Since 1999, Roush Racing had held an informal gong show where many of the nation's young drivers applied for a series of tests that not only tested driving ability, but also their public relations savvy and their personality traits. Former winners included Kurt Busch and Carl Edwards. In 2005, Discovery Channel decided to produce a documentary about the evaluations. Some of the names on the show were Justin Allgaier and David Reagan, but the winner of the competition was Eric Darnell. Darnell was the grandson of Bay Darnell, a Midwestern stock car legend. Darnell and Reagan, alongside 2004 winner Todd Cleaver and runner-up Danny O'Quinn, began competing in the Truck and Bush Series for Roush Racing. Roush really needed this talent to develop, as Mark Martin had agreed to go back on his pledge to retire after 2005 because Roush simply didn't have anyone to drive the 6 car in the future. The original plan was for Jamie McMurray to replace Mark in the 6, but Jamie was slotted into the 97 team after Kurt Busch fell out with Roush and signed with Penske. Mark was adamant that 2006 would be his last season full-time in the 6 car. Darnell drove the 99 in trucks, and Reagan split the 6 truck with Mark in 2006. Daniel Quinn and Todd Cleaver were placed in the Bush series that year. O'Quinn struggled, scoring only 5 top 10s at a time when Roush was winning a lot in that series, with cup regulars like Edwards and Greg Biffle. He finished 19th in points, and Cleaver fared only a little better in 17th. Neither driver had really stood out at any moment. Roush ultimately decided to give the 6 car to David Reagan for 2007, putting an end to a disappointing era of development drivers for the team. Darnell did go on to win races in trucks, but never could crack the top two series on a permanent basis in a good ride. Cleaver disappeared from NASCAR, but he still runs late models in Wisconsin, and Danny O'Quinn held down the Ford at JD Motorsports in the Nationwide Series for several years. All these guys were solid drivers, but Jack Roush was notorious for not having patience, and the looming decision on Mark Martin's replacement compounded the issue. However, Jack Roush was also guilty of creating the environment for this sort of thing to fester. 
Since the series inception in 1982, the Bush slash Nationwide slash Xfinity series has always been a playground for cup stars. In the 90s, Mark Martin and Jack Roush cleaned up the competition in that series, entering in as many races as they could. There was immense value for a company to sponsor a cup driver's Bush entry. I won't go as far to say Mark Martin's Winn-Dixie scheme was as iconic as his Valvoline 6 car, but Winn-Dixie probably scored a lot of sponsor recognition for a fraction of what Valvoline was paying. Anyway, during NASCAR's boom period in the early 2000s, many companies decided to back cup drivers in Bush races. This created a problem where the best equipment in the Bush series was being occupied by cup teams putting their cup stars in the cars for the majority of the season for seat time. For example, if you exclude Kevin Harvick, who wasn't supposed to be full-time cup in 2001, only 7 of the 33 Bush series races in 2001 were won by full-time cup drivers. By 2006, just 5 years later, 33 of the 35 races in the Bush series were won by full-time cup competitors, and 8 of the top 10 in points were cup regulars. The only two races won by Bush regulars were Kentucky and Milwaukee, which didn't have the cup series there that weekend. Even still, Harvick was in every race that season and won the title. It's like these cup teams tried to find new talent, gave up on them after 10 races and just said, okay, the sponsor wants Kevin Harvick or Carl Edwards or whomever instead because they know they can compete for wins. The lack of hotshot talent in 2005 created a problem for Chip Ganassi in the summer of 2006. After fielding rookies in two out of his three cars in 2006 in Reed Sorensen and David Stremme, Ganassi was left with a vacancy in his other car when Casey Mears announced his move to Hendrick for 2007, ironically to fill a void that could have been filled by Blake Feast had he performed well in 2004. Ganassi probably wasn't interested in fielding another guy with hardly any Bush Series experience, let alone cup racing, and no worthwhile veterans were realistic options on the market. So Chip decided to look outside of NASCAR entirely. Juan Pablo Montoya was getting tired of Formula 1 by the summer of 2006. The politicking and the lack of competitive balance was wearing him out. JPM was always a pure racer through and through. When he heard about Chip's ordeal, he made a call and a deal was reached, shocking the racing world. This wasn't older guys like Kimi or Jensen Button doing NASCAR for fun in their retirement years. This was an F1 driver in his prime saying, I'm going to NASCAR and there's nothing you can do about it. But this was no deal that needed time to grow. Yes, Montoya needed time to learn stock car racing, but he had already achieved tremendous things with Chip Ganassi. In 1999, he rocketed to the kart title as a rookie, replacing Alex Zanardi, scoring seven wins, many on tracks that he had not ever seen before. He won the 2000 Indy 500 in the first kart to IRL crossover of the split, and he probably should have won the kart title again if not for poor reliability, ending any OP he had. Montoya's first season in 2007, ending with him winning Cup Series Rookie of the Year and taking his first win at Sonoma. It really opened the floodgates. Other car owners saw what Ganassi had done, and a deluge of open-wheel drivers flooded into any open cup ride. Five of the six rookie contenders in 2008 had open-wheel backgrounds, but three of those five guys did not even make it to season's end. The global financial crisis of 2008 hit everyone hard, but in racing it hit harder than in other sports. Sponsorship is the lifeblood of any successful race team. You won't be able to compete, let alone win, without it. By this time, many of NASCAR's solid mid-pack teams felt the sponsorship woes. Evernham was partially bought by George Gillette, owner of the Montreal Canadiens. When the 10 car opened up, the team signed Patrick Carpentier, a French-Canadian driver who had raced in kart in the IRL, but whose open-wheel career had ended. He was already racing in Grand Am. Dario Franchi, the defending IndyCar and Indy 500 winner, had signed with Ganassi to drive the 40 car after David Stremme's lackluster term. Sam Hornish Jr., long regarded as the IRL's American star, swapped a Penske Dallara in 07 for a Penske Dodge in 08. Jacques Villeneuve had been on fire in the 90s, winning the Indy 500, the car title, and the F1 World Championship in a span of three years. But by 2008, his career was long past its heyday, and the same could be said for the team he drove for, Bill Davis Racing, which could only field him in his Daytona 500 attempt, and that was it. The combination of the American Open Wheel split and the Master Settlement Agreement, which banned tobacco advertising, combined with the economic downturn, had sucked all the money from American Open Wheel Racing. I'm sure it's just a coincidence that the IRL and Champ Car reunified as, as soon as the economy was in the toilet, right? But these talented drivers didn't think they were making enough money in the IRL, as they could have in NASCAR. Frankiti and Hornish won both the championship and the Indy 500, there was nothing else for them to do there. Frankiti admitted years later that his NASCAR move was economically driven, and he went back to IndyCar when his cup ride shut down due to lack of sponsorship. Regan Smith ended up winning the 2008 Rookie of the Year title for a Dale Earnhardt Incorporated team that had just absorbed Gin Racing and was about to be merged with Chip Ganassi Racing. His ride shut down at the end of the season and he was off to Furniture Row Racing. Huh, I wonder whatever happened to that team. 2009 saw the emergence of the only overwhelmingly successful cup star from that era of rookies, Joey Logano. Logano as a teenager was winning Hooters Pro Cup races and even started a few ASA races before that series' demise. 
Joe Gibbs won the sweepstakes to sign him, and it really paid off for JGR, at least in the East Series and Nationwide Series, that is. Logano was a stud from the get-go in Nationwide, as he won his third race in the series at Kentucky. Joe Gibbs racing was dominant in Nationwide in 2008, but their cup trio of Kyle Busch, Denny Hamlin, and Tony Stewart got to be in those rides most of the season. Logano only really had the standalone races to get things done, and he did that. While his counterparts for other teams were not making the most of the cup stars being absent, Joey did. That's why it was a slam dunk decision to have him replace Tony Stewart in the 20 car when Stewart left to form Stewart Haas Racing at the end of the year. In the NFL, you hear about a consensus number one overall pick at quarterback being referred to as a generational prospect. Well, Joey Logano was NASCAR's equivalent, no question. It seemed as though a cup team had broken through and signed an immediate superstar who was going to compete right away. But it was far from easy for Joey in his time with Gibbs in the Cup Series. In his entire time in the 20 car, he only won two races, one of them range shortened, and never finished higher than 16th in points. After his fourth season in 2012, he was facing demotion back down to the Nationwide Series for 2013 until a spot opened up for him at Penske, and the switch saved his career. Joey Logano looked to be a sure thing as a prospect, and he eventually turned into that, but it was a slow, long process. He needed to gain experience at the top level. Unfortunately, most of his peers could barely muster a season in the lower division before facing the chopping block. Stock car racing for most of its history had been about veteran experience over assumed natural talent. Perhaps outliers like Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart, and Kyle Busch had made people forget that. By the start of the 2010s, most of the Cup Series field was locked into their rides, and the domination of Cup stars in the Nationwide Series left the sport lacking for young talent. The open wheel invasion fizzled out extremely quickly, with only Montoya and to some extent Sam Hornish left standing. And due to the struggling economy, there were no new teams joining the Cup Series grid. Well, when I say new teams, I mean no new teams like Track House or 2311 of recent years. One such team that formed back then was Front Row Motorsports, an ironic name because in their early years, they were nowhere near the front row. Founded by Bob Jenkins, a franchisee of Taco Bell and KFC, they were a field filler for many years, searching for sponsors to improve their standing in the sport. Well, in 2010, they definitely got a sponsor. Kevin Conway earned notoriety as the only rookie in the Rookie of the Year battle in 2010. Truck Series veteran Terry Cook officially registered in a Starden Park ride for the short-lived Whitney Motorsports, but Kevin Conway, with his sponsorship, was going to win it by default. This wouldn't be so notorious if not for the sponsor that Conway brought to Front Row. That would be none other than Extends, a certain pill that claims to assist a certain body function's magnitude, let's say. This, combined with Conway's poor performance, drawing the ire of Jeff Gordon at Chicagoland, turned Conway into a running joke for the 2010 season. Despite a late season switch to Robbie Gordon's team, Conway walked away with Rookie of the Year regardless, but only finished above 30th three times and only started three more cup races after that season. Front Row Motorsports, on the other hand, is now a consistent mid-pack squad and even won the 2021 Daytona 500 with Michael McDowell. The Racers Group, or TRG Motorsports, had a short-lived stint in NASCAR, but they stayed long enough to win the 2011 Rookie of the Year with Andy Lally. TRG and Lally had a long history in sports car racing, cleaning up in Grand Am's GT class in the 2000s. By 2011, they had diversified into NASCAR and tapped Lally to drive. Andy Lally is awesome, but the season was a struggle. They definitely did better than Conway the year before, but a driver with no stock car experience and a team that didn't specialize in stock car racing was a recipe for suffering. But in the end, they were rewarded with Rookie of the Year, and Lally went back to sports cars. Even to this day, he still makes starts at road courses and does a good job. I don't think Andy Lally has ever driven super great equipment in his NASCAR career, but he does have support from the fans, and his name will be there forever as a Cup Series Rookie of the Year. 2012 was perhaps the low point of NASCAR's Rookie of the Year list. It was won by a driver who only started 15 of the 36 races and posted a best finish of 26. It was Stephen Light driving for Joe Falk's Circle Sport team. What's significant about this is that Stephen Light, once upon a time, did get his shot as a development driver in the mid-2000s. He even won the same Kentucky Nationwide race a year before Joey Logano had won it. But unlike Logano, who drove for Gibbs, Light had the misfortune of driving for Robert Yates Racing as that team's existence was coming to an end. He had a big sponsor in the City Group, but it all fell apart. He signed with Richard Childress Racing the next year, but saw his amount of races cut in half because the sponsor, Holiday Inn, wanted a cup driver in Clint Boyer instead. It's hard to get into rhythm with a new team running part-time like that. After a short Childress stint, he never got another good ride in NASCAR again. Most were just start and park entries, just there to collect a check. I think Stephen Light could have been a solid cup driver, he just never got the opportunity. By the start of 2011, NASCAR had finally realized that the fans were sick and tired of cup drivers winning every nationwide race and championship. They finally changed the rules so that any driver would have to declare what series they wanted to earn points in. 
Cup drivers could still race in nationwide in trucks, they just couldn't score championship points, incentivizing teams to hire up-and-coming drivers. Over the years, they've clamped down even further to prevent Cup drivers winning in the lower two series. By 2013, this had bore fruit in the Cup series. Ricky Stenhouse parlayed back-to-back -back nationwide titles into taking over for Matt Kenseth at Roush. The now Xfinity series was starting to produce more talent into the Cup than it had in over two decades. Chase Elliott, Eric Jones, Chris Buescher, William Byron, Daniel Suarez all won in the Xfinity series and most of them got great rides in the Cup series as rookies. We have an entirely new batch of drivers in NASCAR today. To really drive the point home, let's take a look at these statistics. 12 drivers born from 1980 to 1985 have combined for 214 wins and 4 championships in Cup. 18 drivers born from 1990 to the present have combined for 127 wins, 4 championships and counting. Meanwhile, only 2 drivers born from 1986 to 1989 have combined for a total of 4 wins in the Cup Series. The only 2 Cup Series race winners born in that stretch are Ricky Stenhouse and Shane Van Gisbergen. There was an entire half decade that produced 2 Cup winners and Stenhouse is only one on super speedways and SVG is not even from America. There's an entire generation of guys that flamed out of NASCAR before their careers could ever go anywhere. Economic downturns, sponsors wanting cup guys in the lower series, and team owners being impatient with some of their development drivers all played a part in an entire generation of NASCAR drivers missing. Joey Logano is the only driver from that era to rise above all the mess that was post-2008 NASCAR and become a champion. And even he almost got ran out of the cup series due to underperformance at one point. It just goes to show how thin the line between success and failure is and that sometimes you have to take advantage of every opportunity in front of you. Even then, nothing is guaranteed. Forces outside of your control can upset even the best laid plans in any area of life. Thankfully, NASCAR is a solid group of younger guys who will carry the banner into the future. And with manufacturers taking over development programs rather than the teams, there's just more solid talent being picked. It seems as though Toyota produces so many good talents that they don't have enough rides for them all. Sure, there's always going to be flameouts, and these days a lot of paid drivers and equipment they don't deserve, but I think at the end of the day, there's never been a better time to be a NASCAR prospect than right now. For every Kyle Larson, there's a Todd Cleaver, someone who did get an opportunity, but not a great one, and paid for it. The lesson to be learned here is that life isn't fair, but it's not the end of the world. Just getting to say that you drove for Rick Hendrick or Jack Roush even for a brief time is something millions of hard luck heroes at local short tracks across the country wish they could say. If you guys enjoyed this video, leave a like and subscribe, and leave a comment down below about a NASCAR driver you were sure was going to make it big, but ultimately was a bust. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.